You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Hello, I'm Amber A. And I'm Andrew McKay. And you're listening to Into the Portal, your gateway to the bizarre. Today, we have a brand new Film Friday, don't we, Andrew? Finally back with some uh, with a Film Friday. It has been a minute. And believe me, guys, we've watched a lot of movies as of late yes. because of this uh, auspicious occasion, uh, the Halloween season. <laughs> We like to celebrate, so uh, we've gone through the gambit watching a lot of movies, and oh, we've yeah. picked one that we think, well, we just really love this movie. Definitely. And we think you guys will, too, because there's a lot of duds out there. <laughs> oh, man, there really, there really are, uh, with some notable examples that we've watched recently. Maybe we can uh, talk okay, about that, that in a little bit, too. Oh. But today, we're discussing the 2012 film, uh, The Woman in Black. And essentially what we're looking at here, the reason we wanted to cover this this film, uh, not just because we really enjoyed it and the mise-en-scene and the cinema, it's all just really well done, but because it obviously is perfect for Halloween, we're talking about uh, the spirit world for sure and how restless a spirit can really be. And of course, there's a lot of different versions of this we've talked about in the past with um, uh, Stephen Williams' Ghost Investigator and Poltergeist and all these kinds of things. But especially with this film, it's the wonderings of uh, the violent capabilities of a human spirit that's restless and vengeful, or perhaps maybe even something demonic attached to the energy of that said spirit that has gone through some sort of tra- tragedy. But uh, either way, things get really dark really fast in this movie, which, uh, which we uh, quite enjoy. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a really good one to touch on right away is this this spiritual realm that we seem to enter as soon as from the get go with this movie, which I really like. And I, I think another thing to add to that would be the theme of loss For sure. and how that definitely ties in. It's very evident um, those lost in tragedy and, and then those that are left behind. Uh, each character we see in this film has experienced loss in their own way or another. We see it in Kips. We see it in the dailies with Jerome. Mm-hmm. And of course, with the woman in black. Of course. And it's a very dark theme. There's lots. This is a super dark movie, hey? Like it really treads that line of just, because obviously it deals with children, which is always a very sensitive subject. Absolutely. And it's actually funny you even say that because what I was just thinking there too, like it's a dark movie and it is literally dark the entire time. Like the weather is mm. that that drab London uh, London fog and rain, right? And then he leaves mm-hmm. the city and he goes into uh, into the, into the burbs and it's very much the same. The oh, mud yeah. on the side streets as he started. You know, he's he's looking out the window of the train and it's it's all very bleak and drab. Oh, and super bleak, morbid, if you will, morbid, definitely. And I think that mirrors the overall tone of, of depression that kind of emanates throughout this entire thing. Definitely. So just like getting into generalities before we even kick off with our plot overview or anything like this is this is pretty recent 2012 you yeah. know yeah. it has some uh, fairly modern fairly effective special effects i'd say and uh, i think it was very well directed i think we're dealing with a very strong director and uh, producer team uh, directed by james watkins and the screenplay was written by jane goldman Ooh. i thought this was interesting like we knew that this was an adaption from a novel yeah for sure I didn't know that this was actually the second adaption, though. Ooh, really? Yeah, there was actually another um, movie under the same name, and it was filmed back in the 80s, 89. We're gonna so I'm not sure. Back. We're going to have to check that out. I just pulled that little fact up, and I was like, wait a second, because we love to watch earlier versions. And we do. This one, I don't know. We'll have to see. If yeah. anyone's watched it, let us know. But totally. Anyways, yeah, that was interesting. And, and it was a, f- a novel by Susan Hill, I should clarify there. Of course. So just to give her some credit. <laughs> this is a pretty cool little story. And I think 
the plot was very effective in its simplicity. It could have gone awry at many moments, and uh, we can discuss that in finer detail. Yeah, definitely. But let's touch on some of the main characters here. So we've already touched on uh, the main character, Arthur Kipps, played by Daniel Radcliffe. A very well-known household name around here, (laughs) Harry Potter. It's hard not to see Harry in him in this movie. That's the excuse that my (laughs) younger sister uses whenever we try to get her to, well, whenever we try to get her to watch scary movies. Ratcliffe's not in every scary movie, but with this one specifically, it's too scary. I get like, she's like, oh, I'll just be thinking it's Harry Potter the whole time. And I'm just like, that's, you can't flip flop back and forth. You're either scared of it. You don't want to watch it. Or you just think you're going to be looking at Harry Potter the whole time when you're watching it. But <laughs> very similar though, movies. like very, his, his appearance isn't that different because no. he hasn't really like grown out a full beard or anything yet. He's got similar, like, you know, like he doesn't have the glasses, I guess that's kind of a dead giveaway for Harry. But, but it's like all those scenes where he was Harry, those solo scenes where he's walking around mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It's like, that was just such perfect practice for this role yeah. because he's so good at that. It's very he effective is. where he's got the looking up at the sounds coming from the ceiling or oh, turning yeah. around in the, those solo scenes. Oh, even like when he's uh, dealing with all the old papers and stuff, reminds me of papers like, you know, in the library when he's dealing with the mysteries and like yeah. Hogwarts and stuff. Or even like his wardrobe is very similar to, it's a very similar like feeling as far as like, you know, the, the wizarding world uh, fashions sure. and things of that nature. And even just simple things like the way that he lights um, the candles in the building, like when he's in the actual eel manner. And Uh, that's just us being so used to it, right? Like our intention was definitely not to draw direct parallels. No, actually that's kind of a side Um, note, but it's interesting though. Totally. And he is effective in this movie. I think he does a good job. It was a very strong leading role. Along with that though, we do have his son, uh, the very cute Joseph Kipps, who's like, you know, just the, the unfortunate survivor of a very unfortunate situation with his mother, Stella, who dies, and we later find out why. But then we also have the Dailies, which are pretty important, and uh, he meets Samuel Daly, like, right off the bat, and that relationship solidified pretty closely as, like, you know, his, uh, what would you say, like, almost like his, uh, not his cohort, but, like, his... Accom- not his accomplice either, well, but his, his, one, his friend. Yeah, he's the his only confidant. one willing to really talk to him, right? Yeah. I mean, he's the mm-hmm. only, yeah, confidant there because yeah. he's got nobody else is willing to even go near him. No, when he gets to when he gets to the, to the suburbs, when he gets to this, yeah, to this town, this right? strange little town, and it's because uh, Mister Daly isn't superstitious. And even though he's lost his own son, he refuses to buy into the town's beliefs about the going souls and things of that nature. And then we also have uh, the Jeromes, which come up quite a bit. He's the town lawyer, and we have his wife and their daughter, their secret daughter, as I'll refer to her, because she's not, not seen initially. And then, of course, the whole reason he's there, right? We have Mrs. Alice Drablo, who is the owner of the estate that he's there to kind of settle. Uh, I, I guess her and her husband, who never really plays into the plot of this film other than in the portraits in the house. Yeah, and most, and there's really even not that much no. of a view of that either. There's the one prominent photograph that we get with the scratched out eyes that we can discuss yeah. later. That's the real image of that couple we get. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's very vague. Very vague. What, what, what did they do for a living? Who were they? I mean, it's all so vague. Like, we, we, don't, we don't know at all. We just, we get just enough information, which is what I like about this movie. They don't overcomplicate it. It's effective in the simplicity, again, right. on multiple levels. Again, and then also the other last person that I will mention is obviously the woman in black. Uh, her name comes out later as Jeanette. And we'll find out who she is as we go along here. But I just wanted to start this off before we get into the plot again. Like, what mm. what were some of our impressions of this film? Like, how would you yeah. describe this film? Like, anything that really popped out to you? Because, uh, like we already said, we've watched a lot of these horror, thriller, supernatural type movies in the last little bit. Yeah. And we both thought this one was particularly effective. Well, so. uh, yeah, I, I think for... You know, it's funny. I think for people who really love uh, scary movies, they don't like this movie. You know what I mean? The, the, the people who really want to be scared, scared, scared might not enjoy this this film unless they have a family and children. And then I think it mm. will horrify them to their core. Oh, yeah. Uh, right? And, and <laughs> Depends on your situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that that's what... I mean, not that we have kids or anything, right? But it's like that there was a 
part of that story just because of the children being taken. That's just, there's a darkness in that even without the actual film playing out that way where it's like so demonic. It's not like, uh, oh my, oh my gosh, like the film, I mean, many of the films we've covered on film Friday that are like rated R, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? That are like hereditary or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, there's a lot of violence in Woman in Black that's very similar to other films like that, but you would never juxtapose them. It's it's a lot more eloquent in its yeah. in its um it's a period piece that has that going for it. Yeah, maybe that's it. It it, it has yeah eloquency in, in the subtleties of it. And I think that again plays into its effectiveness. Yeah. That's interesting you say that people that want to be scared won't like this movie because <laughs> like I told you the other night, like I was working well, yeah. on my laptop and I had both screens and I'm just in this little room by myself with the lights out and I had that on with the headphones on. And this, that movie, like, genuinely scared me when it was like, it's right in my face. And I was watching it by myself. I was home alone. And it really genuinely did. Like, just because of the atmospheric tones. Right. Based on the the visual aspects, the lighting is super effective. Like you said, this movie's dark through and through. It's just dark. And then you also get the music. And that's really effective, coupled with... The, uh, the just the sound in general, right? Like the way that it's mixed. Like yeah. this is very professional. It's very polished. All of it, all uh, around. Totally. Versus a lot of things that we see that aren't quite at that level. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just don't like you know. It's all in the buildup. It's all in that. It's and uh, it's yeah. it's not in the actual the scary moment itself because we saw a lot of ineffective attempts at that when we were trying to watch. <laughs> what was it called? An the American, American haunting. An American haunting. Which was about the Bell Witch, which was, should have been really good. Another period piece. And it was another period piece. It started off in modern times. And I was like, oh, Lord, let's see where oh, it's going. And yeah. then it flipped back. And I was like, okay, maybe I can watch this. And then it just fell apart. And, but- you know, <laughs> and, and I, I totally agree with you. And you know why it fell apart? Like, because, you know, well, there's a bunch of different reasons, but like, here's a big difference between something like where they're trying to show a, a witch or a ghost like the woman in black that's like physically violent, whereas like we're watching so much violence in the woman in black that's darkness. But there was never a moment where uh, Mr. Kipps gets like scratched in the face no. or where something's thrown at him or where he's no. even physically touched in any way at all. It's there's, all yeah. this atmospheric horror rather yeah. than trying to show in a much more direct way, which is, I feel like... a I don't even know. Like, again, it's a period piece, but kind of a more like modern horror movie thing. Poltergeist vibes where it's going to be. Mm-hmm. That's what's that's what's scary is like a ghost can touch you. A ghost can harm you physically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But it's like you don't need you don't need that wow. to be scary. That's funny you say that because obviously we get very obvious examples in An American Haunting when the girl is strung up exactly. by her hair or whatever. And it's just this very ineffective, getting like slapped. getting slapped over and over again or getting dragged this way, that way. When she, Anyways, there's a lot of moments in that movie you're just like, literally, I just have to look away because this is really bad acting. It's really painful. But This is turning into just like crapping all over American yeah, Haunting. It is, it is. So let's move away from that. <laughs> but we have, like we were just saying, like, you know, like we have compared this to a couple of films already and some of my favorite things about this movie before we get into the specifics of the plot more so is the camera work one of my favorite things is this camera work because it's effective in drawing attention to elements that are worthy of notice and I think we get that a lot just in the simplicity of capturing the expression of, say, an inanimate object like a toy in the room and the way that the expression on that inanimate object changes based on the light that's revealed or taken away from it. Oh, yeah. You know, things like that. That's obviously lighting is camera work in conjunction, but things like that. You know what else it does? Sorry, I have to say this because you just reminded me. I don't mean to cut you off, but like in some, I'm picturing the doll and I'm picturing the monkeys and I'm picturing some of these things that you're talking about. And it almost... Monkeys it and- almost implied to me the way they did that lighting and camera work that these objects were alive almost. Yeah, they're or that, watching or them. that yeah, yeah, or the the woman is working through the woman in black's working through them. They're conduits Something. through it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Totally. So it could be anything in the house. Oh, it's so spooky. Exactly. And we do see those things come to life quite literally at moments in the movie. And then also within that category of like camera work. I thought the way that they played with the windows, especially in this movie, was really interesting with the camera. There are basically, like, I would say 
close to 90% of the times we see the woman in black, it's through the window. Right. So there's always that element of like, she's seeing through the veil to the other side. Yes. There's the very obvious analogy. And also, well, yeah, ve- the veil to the other side. And also, I mean, it's literally a portal. Like windows are a portal. those things. And it's also a protective barrier. There is something in between. Right. But even though he can see and it's like transparent, it's still there. And we see that not even just with Mr. Kipps, but we also see it with uh, Mr. Daly, right? When he's in the house at the very final scene, when he walks into that room and then he has the woman in black screaming at him through the window. Yes. And I honestly feel like they could have made her face a little scarier. We both agree on that, I think. We've got some, a few bones to pick. We'll get to that at the end. But overall, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, like there was more than one spirit. Like we see the the sun through the window too, right? When he's staring out through the pouring rain at the the uh, the cross that's in the mud and things like that in the marsh. Yeah, fairly spooky, uh, spooky. imagery there as well. A cross stuck in the mud yeah. in a floodplain area. Mm-hmm. Never ideal. No, uh, and it's just like all haphazardly, kind of like you know. Like it right. could just sink right in too, kind of thing. I, what I loved is that they, you already said this, but they get into things pretty quick. And I've oh, said yeah. this a million times on Film Fridays. I don't like it when when movies take too long. Like I enjoyed the dialogue at the beginning where the lawyer, it, it wasn't a too long of a scene where he's sitting in the office and his boss is telling him this isn't a charity, right? Uh, things like that. But even just with the first scene where we get with the, the girls playing, the three, the three girls mm-hmm. playing and we see the little bluebirds on the cups. And to me, that was symbolic of of flight, right? These 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 three cute little birds about to take flight, mm-hmm. and that's what we see. The, the the woman in black makes them, or we don't know this yet, but presumably, they're something's drawing them, and they jump out of the window. And all yeah. we, we don't see them land. We all we see is them just look to the corner. Yep. And then and we just hear the screams after they jump out of the window, right? Straight to the face of the doll again. So like what you were talking about, the camera work, it's like right onto the face of a doll in the chair. And my first thought is like, is, was the woman in the corner? Did they literally see her or is she working through the doll? But they willfully throw themselves out the window to their death, right? So this is the beginning, the beginning moments. And then we get Kibbs, you know dead wife mirroring him mirroring him in the mirror Mm -hmm. uh, contemplating suicide yeah so we had two instances of loss right away so going back to that theme that uh, kind of plays out throughout the whole thing right it's the loss the the screams of the mother in agony over the loss of her three daughters and then we get the mirroring of kibbs and his wife and him almost looking through to the other side and wanting to be on that other side. Yeah. And you see him with the razor pressed up against his neck and it's very obvious. And and then of course his, he's interrupted by his son. Yes. And, and you think like the first time I watched this, you think from that first scene and then go into Kibbs in the mirror that this is going to be a haunted house movie that he's going to be assigned to go to this house where clearly these girls, ha- there's something in the house made them do this and that's going to be a haunted house movie. But it turns out to be so much more than that, which mm-hmm. I, which is so interesting. It is not confined. This is not a situational haunt, haunting, no. which is so much different than a lot of horror movies, right? That we or true to life stories that we read about and things like that. But he gets assigned to this place that's called Yule Marsh House. What a name. Or Eel Marsh House. Eel Marsh House. Eel. Eel Marsh House. <laughs> they, they, the accents in this movie, they kind of pronounce it a bunch of different ways. It's yeah. like with the, there's a bit of the Scottish and the guy at the at the hotel. You have to really the, look at the papers in the film, like the actual documents that he reads. You have to look at them because it does say E E L. It sounds Manor. like they're calling him Arthur Kibbs yeah. with a B the entire movie, but apparently it's Kips with a P. Like Kippa. Chips. Chips. Kipper, the Kipper and the Corpse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he's assigned to uh, look over the Drablo estate, the recently deceased Alice Drablo, uh, who died the month previously. And uh, But it's not explained to him. I mean, he doesn't know. He's just told that he needs to go through a mountain of paperwork. And the first thing that pops into my mind is, like, they don't even know what paperwork is there. <laughs> like, his law firm's just sending him there. There's, like, there's a mountain of paperwork, but nobody lives in the house. It's and, been empty for a long, yeah, for a month. Exactly. And, and it's all in shambles and disrepair. It's just very, it's just so, you'd think it would just be, like, send, send the title, send the things you need. Anyway, mm-hmm. but... 
they have to set him up some way, right? And and of course, the first person he bumps into on his ride, like you mentioned at the top, is Samuel Daly, the, the biggest town skeptic. He's the one guy who doesn't think anything strange going on in the town has to do with this house. Yeah. Or has to do with the woman in black. Exactly. Uh, but <laughs> he, he kind of alludes to the strangeness right away, though. He says, you know, we don't get to see too many new faces here. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I mean... Is is Kip's asking himself why? I mean, why is that? That's he sort just of goes odd. along with it. <laughs> I mean, sure, it's an odd place, but it gets even stranger. I mean, he's rejected at the the inn. As soon as he gets there, it's like we're full. Right. Okay. Are you really? It's a hot. It's a hot spot. Hey, everyone's mm. here for the tourism. Hmm. It's, that's odd. And then, of course, <laughs> they give him the only space is a space in the attic, which is a little boy's room. Yeah. Uh, there's toys in there. The bed is super short. I mean, I would have rather just sat outside for the night, probably, if mm-hmm. I was him, personally. That's not the same attic space we see in the very first scene, is it? No, this is the attic This is the attic at the hotel. Okay. So this is another child that's been lost. Oh, okay, right. It's uh, their child. Right, the right. innkeepers. Okay. And they're just trying to do their part as townspeople to, because they, they don't want any other children to be taken, right. I guess. So again, we don't know this right away. It's no. just this super standoffish barkeep. Uh, well, his wife's a little more warm. His wife's a little more warm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. of course, we're wondering why doesn't, uh, why don't these people leave, the t- including the town lawyer who presumably would have the skills to work elsewhere. Uh, yeah. But he tries to send them off right away. And he's, he like, they, they're not very good at it. They're not good at lying and saying, everything's no. fine here. Here's the paperwork. You can go. They're yeah. kind of like, oh, jeez, oh, uh, but, oh, t- uh, <laughs> take yeah, the paper, you, you oh, here, 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 just toss it on and run away, ah. Yeah. Like, that's kind of the vibe. Yeah. So it's not really very effective at getting him to leave. Yeah. No, it's not. Is that all you had to say on that one? <laughs> yeah, and I just like sit back and stare. Great audio, uh, audio experience here with my facial expressions for Amber. <laughs> I just like sit back, stare, like, yeah. <laughs> Mic drop. All right. Yeah, no, you're right. They don't do a good job. And it only adds to his suspicions, which reinforces his stubbornness to actually go to this house and do his due diligence and prove to his boss that he's actually capable of doing this job. And he's because only obviously, doing it for his kid. Well, he's doing it for his child. Yes, that's true. Because obviously, he, that's all he has left. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So he, he's there to do what he needs uh. to do. He's like <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the parallels between Rambo and Woman in Black. <laughs> Stark contrast. So after his unfortunate encounter, I guess you would call it, with Jerome and his wife, where they basically literally shove him out the door. And then yeah. it's almost like he, he can see him on the other side just waiting there. He's like, what's he going to do? Is he going to come back? And he just sees a shadow and he's like, well, okay. Yeah. And so he gets the only man that will do it to take him back to the house as opposed to back to the station. Old school, right? He's got his horse and buggy. He even tells him, he's like, he's at first, Mr. Kibbs is outraged at the price. And he's like, well, I'm the only one that'll do it. So Mm -hmm. anyways, it's a very classic. He kind of reminds me of, I don't know what this guy's called, like the grave digger. Yeah. Or like the the graveyard master. And I wrote this in here too. Like, like because it's the horse drawn buggy, it's almost like he's, it's like taking you to the gates of hell or something, right? Like he's the transport vessel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when you get a look at where they're going and the route, it's like, okay, that's beautiful cinematography. First of all, still pretty effective special effects, like, you know, with the marsh and then the, like the way the roads like gets washed out and, and, and reveals itself at certain points, uh, depending on the tide. And uh, yeah, this is pretty much one of the most isolated places you could probably dream up in your imagination. Like, I'm thinking of like the the special effects artists and like the the fun they must have had just like creating this place. Oh yeah. Yeah, so they I would call the journey harried a little bit. This eel manor is like it's just so mysterious. It has this really weird it, it's like its own island. And again, it's almost like he is literally going into that in between space where he's not quite in the world of the living and he's not quite in the world of the dead. He's kind of in that ambiguous spot in between. And as they kind of approach the manor, he obviously disembarks and is left there and is told essentially, he didn't know this at first, but he's told that the tide goes out. So there's only certain times people can come get him and whatever else. So he's like, Oh, okay. Interesting to know. 
<laughs> you're not really given much on no, this. No, he was... You know, he reminds me a lot of uh, the main character in Dracula. The, yeah. He, he's a solicitor. Yeah. Yep. It's very, very similar. similar. Goes to this haunt, not haunted, but, you know, this uh, mysterious mansion in, in a distant land. Well, not so distant for him. He's still in England, obviously. Well, you but, know, yeah. You know, it's almost as if, yeah, they're just entering this different plane, this ethereal plane. But as he like kind of approaches, I love how the camera, uh, it actually, you see almost like from the woman in black's perspective where it's in the uppermost window and it's kind of the little bit of the shaky cam as if someone's gazing down on him as he approaches, Yeah, which again plays into one of my favorite elements with the camera work and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. That perspective is so creepy, right? It is. It's so, oh, it's great, but it's really effective. It sets the tone right away. So it's almost as if the whole house is watching him as he enters and it's in shambles, total disarray outside and inside, like clearly uncapped for quite some time. And this feeling is just like this, this disarray is just like this mirror to him. I feel like in some way, it's almost like a distraction to a certain degree from the secrets that are kind of kept within almost. Yeah. Like, especially with the landscaping being all overgrown and everything's kind of like, like, especially the little cemetery out front that he notices right away. He's like, oh, hmm, they have their own little thing going on here. Yeah. And then he kind of goes further within. But I just thought that was really interesting. What did you think of that? Well, I, 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 you walk, he walks up to this mansion and immediately it's like, it looks like it has been abandoned for a lot longer than 30 days, Mm -hmm. you know? And and, and we don't know the exact timeline. Like it said rough, like it was like a month, she died a month prior, but maybe that was the case when he was in the office and then they had to arrange it. And then by the time we see the scene on the train, it's a little later, but it's like the gates ripped off. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like it looks like it's been abandoned for years. And so it makes you wonder, it's like, was this, was the chick that passed away that he's going, the reason he's going there, she was living in the house. Or maybe because it's such a big house, there's only a certain, certain compartments that are actually maintained uh, and like kept up I because mean, and we she's just all alone. And we're just not shown those, I guess. But yeah. it's like what I thought of seeing that the state of the, the mansion is like, she's living in it like that. Like mm-hmm. for de- for however long it's been since her sister that we don't know of yet because Kips hasn't discovered uh, the ghost no, yet. He hasn't, yeah. Has been deceased, but has just been haunting her sister that's still alive in that house living in. Sh- like, yeah. I'm just picturing the madness. She's that, living in there just like, m- just being haunted. That's exactly what I'm, yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to say. Yeah, I totally, where it just like it mirrors this the psychological nature of what's going on kind of thing. And, you know, it's funny you say that, like, she's been living like that for decades. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. Kind of reminds me of that movie, uh, Grey Gardens, that focused on, like, it was an actual true story about the, I don't know, like, recluses that were related to Jackie Kennedy. And it was a mother and daughter, and they basically lived in this house that was just, like, it should have it was condemned i think after they died but it was like Crazy. They, anyway so they just lived that way so in, in this in that sense maybe it is believable to a certain degree hmm. and this is back in the day we're talking back in the day we're talking like pre-world war one yes i'm thinking yes we have cars but cars are a recent invention we're talking like like, like downton abbey like yeah. leading up to the first world war I, exactly. is like what i'm picturing kind that's of. what i picture too okay so let's get into the actual like so he's in the house here and he enters, of course, we, it's all very dark. He gets into the kitchen area, tries to throw open, like, you know, the drapes. And we see immediately the, the three monkeys, which are very symbolic, you know, the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil kind of thing. And they're revealed. Again, it's another one of these inanimate objects that take, takes on a lot of significance based on the camera work and the lighting and things like that. Yes. And the mise-en-scene. And then we get this uh, other, like, oh, this super creepy thing that I didn't even notice. You had to point it out to me because it's so subtle, but so effective when he's in the kitchen and then he gets, he's trying to light um, one of the, like, um, what are those things called? Those, like, gas lights. It's, we have one outside. Yeah, it's, like a kerosene lan- yeah, lantern. Yeah, a lantern kind of thing. And then as he's doing that, he almost feels like he's being watched and we see it over his shoulder. Again, effective camera work where it's literally the silhouette of the woman from behind and like then the barely. slow turn. Yeah. She slowly turns and, and disappears. And you can just barely see her. And she's, yeah, because she's not in focus. Yeah, it's all so in the darkness. the creepiness. Yeah, it's yeah. like, I didn't, I thought that was an inanimate object. I didn't even like, because I was watching him. But again, right, it's just these subtleties that work really well. And then we get immediately after she disappears and he looks over his shoulder, we get that 
emission of like those that sludge coming out of the faucet and it's yeah. almost like it was like the house's reaction to him he's like almost like repulsed by his presence there Ooh, as if it's I like, like that. this intruder this interloper that shouldn't be there i like that anyways yeah so i thought i loved that and then of course he's wandering around he's not even doing his job <laughs> he does a lot of wandering in this movie i'll say what is he actually well, doing? He's hearing in? noises. I mean, it'd be hard to just sit that plop down. And, yeah. You know? That's and like true. I said to you, too, I was like, well, how the hell does he even know what's what? I mean, nothing's organized. Mm-hmm. He just walks in there. There's like just piles of like stained, ripped papers all over everything. Yeah. And I looked at you and I said, like, the, you know what I would do? I would just put grab all of it, put it right <laughs> in the fireplace, light a match, <laughs> call it a day. Yeah. I mean, who's who's to say anything? You the, work, the whole town's going to have your back. That's it. for sure. The look. lawyer already tried to hand you a thing that said all the necessary paperwork in here. Is your boss really going to say anything? Just just. Just get out of there. Just burn it down and call it a day. Nope. Instead, he pulls a hairy move and goes under the cupboard to start investigating. Literally, he goes back to the cupboard. There's a lot of Harry Potter references in this movie. Anyways. Goes back to the cupboard. He does. (laughs) Literally the cupboard under the stairs. Anyways. You never mentioned this to me before we started recording. I'm just realizing it as we're going through. It's it's all fresh. It's all coming to me right now. Harry. Okay. And so instead of finding Hedwig, he actually finds... Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he does find a baby bird, though. He, a little baby raven, remember? So he hears this weird sound, so he goes upstairs to investigate. I don't know if it's a baby raven. It is. It's a baby raven. It is falls it? out of the nest. It's like this poor little fledgling thing that, that has no feathers on it, essentially. Oh, it's that, fallen out right. of the nest. Yes, 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 yes. And so him, being very loving and caring and gentle, he goes to put it back. Like, this is him. He's the restorer. That's a very huge symbolic moment, I think. Yeah. And so he goes and he ends up doing that and only to be scared away by the mother, right? So hmm, what is this paralleling? What is he getting himself into? He's trying to repair the relationship and the, the connection, right, between the lost baby and the mother, putting it back in the nest, all this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm like totally like forgetting that scene too because then there's like the raven in the bedroom. Is that... It's the same scene. Same, same scene? Yeah. Okay, right. Because yeah. then I'm remembering the raven and, and I'm thinking to myself, like, that raven's got to be the woman in black. Because exactly. then he looks out the window. You're and totally right. There she is, right? If, if sim- symbolically, at least. Right. Like, maybe not literally. Well, but, but no, but that's what, I, that's my question. Like, is it, which one is it? Yeah. Because like, because this spirit is way different than, because, okay, it, it's not a poltergeist because she's not throwing stuff around. It's not a noisy ghost, right? It's a, it's a, it's a. She's a restless spirit, but it's not trapped to the house. She can go anywhere in the village Mm -hmm. and she doesn't physically attack anyone. But if, if he's seen, like if that, if she is the Ravens, like that's a physical manifestation. You know what I mean? Like that's almost like a. Almost like a familiar or something. Or yeah. Like, or That's something... treading on more demonic territory too. Like being True. able to transform it's into just, I, I take it as a symbol of what is to come. It's a foreshadowing moment sure. because he is doing this, right? He's The act of restoring the baby to the nest is what he does in the final scene in the climax of the film, right? right. That, that okay. was my sort of interpretation of that. But yeah, you can definitely go a lot further and like, what if that was her? Because that's exactly what happens. He sees the rape and then he sees the woman. Right. So it's like but pretty instantaneous. Mm-hmm. He goes to open the window, right? Again, we get more symbolism with the window. He's, he's going through the veil. He's opening himself up to it. So there's no barrier. And then... Like, he's doing that to get the raven out, obviously. But if you want to take it symbolically, that's how I interpret it, at least. And then, obviously, then he sees the woman. It's like we say symbolically, but if you're physically in that space doing those physical things when these types of things are happening, it's like we were to ask Stephen Williams, ghost investigator, I think those aren't those aren't symbolic actions. Like, they are in and of themselves individually, literal, but then in a chain, they they allow thinking, something in. That's I'm just thinking, real. like, plot device symbolism. Of you know course, what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on here, and you're right. You like there's so many layers to it, and <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. But obviously, as this plot develops further, we do begin to piece together the puzzle of what's going on in this very small village and the Il Marsh home, beginning with the very unfortunate incident that he starts to kind of. He actually hears it, right? When he's there, he yeah. hears the whole accident happening, but he can't see it. So that's, again, I feel as though the woman has chosen him. She's like, she sees what he does with the baby bird, maybe. She sees him. She sees him, which yes. is very crucial to this 
plot because I think she identifies with him to a certain degree right. and she wants him to understand her and to, she she's literally telling him her story the entire time like right. she's leading it's like a trail of breadcrumbs yes, throughout this it, whole movie totally a trail so again right like I feel like yeah she she wants him to figure all of this out and put together the pieces of the puzzle kind of thing and she's not going to play nice, like, at all. Like, she's ruthless. Like, as soon as, because, like, right, we get that vision, right? We He sees it. As soon as he comes back to town, we get the first tragedy. Yeah. And I think she's trying to show Kips what she's all about. You he's, know what I mean? he's so resistant to it, though, even at that mm. point, right? Even though he's been in the house, he's seen some stuff. He's literally seen her multiple times at this point. And then, yeah, he comes he comes running into town, claiming to a cons- constable that he's heard this crash. And the constable's like, there's no one's been out there except for you, buddy, for mm-hmm. decades. That's a pretty creepy thing to hear from the police chief or whatever, who, you know, the guy that's running the town there in that regard. And right away, little girl comes in with their brothers and she's drank some lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good times, right? Oh. Just wanted to see what that tasted like. Maybe yeah. just mix in that with your apple juice. Mm-hmm. Never a good idea. And then, of course, we don't know this now, but the woman's right there. And that's like how close she is to him this whole time. But even after that, he's so resistant to it. Mm-hmm. It isn't until really he's has these discussions later on with the with Samuel's wife. Uh, her name's escaping oh, Miss me. Daly. Miss, yeah. Miss Daly, we'll call her. I forget her first name. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, I think her is. Elizabeth I Daly? I think so, yeah, Elizabeth. And she ends up acting as a conduit. Uh, that kind of tells him, right? Because yeah. she, she ends up being possessed, and it's the first meeting even he sees this happen, but he still is resistant to it. So they're sitting at the dinner table, and she ends up grabbing a knife and carving the image of a hanging mm-hmm. on the table. Which I actually didn't see the first time. The second time it's, around, we saw that. You have to it's like, like a pause noose. It. <clears throat> you have to like pause the film. And, and the second like, time she does that on a tree next to the mortuary, I don't actually know what. I, I like. We went back and paused it, and I was like, I don't really know what that is. She. It's like a hangman's game. Like it's almost like spelling the letters out. Actually, if anyone has their own take on that, we'd love to hear it because that was one little bit that I forgot to look up. Right. <sighs> Anyway, it's after this dinner scene that we realize that, you know, Sam's against, really against the paranormal, right? He's like, oh, you know, because he finds out that Kips' wife died. Right. So he's saying all those things, right? He's like, oh, you know, you got to be careful of these charlatans. And then, actually, this is probably one of my favorite lines in the movie, when Kips says, and this is such a classic, again, almost like a hairy line, where he's like, I think the worst thing they do is disappoint, like for the the people conducting the seances and stuff Mm -hmm. like that, right? It's Mm -hmm. not about... You know, that's what they do. That's the worst thing they do is disappoint because he knows that his wife is there trying to contact him, but he yeah. can't, he can't do it. He can't break through yet. He, ha- yet he is right there. He can he see is. through the veil and he, and he feels her. He says, right. he's like, he's not, he's not sure. He's pretty ambiguous, which yeah. is why, again, he's in that zone of ambivalence is kind of sometimes what it's, or liminality that in between, you yes. know what I mean? You're not quite in one you know, he's not in the land of the living. He's not in the land of the dead. He's somewhere in between. Right. And a lot of films obviously play on that theme, but this is a bit quite literal in our sense, like with it, with the supernatural and all that. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. And and to, that's a great segue in regards to the supernatural because the house in and of itself, as we see more of it, gets weirder and weirder and weirder, like way beyond the, the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil on the mantle. There is a massive weird deer elk mythical looking thing on the wall that's almost like castle Mm. hoska-esque like it's clearly not a made-up creature it's a real elk but it's like (laughs) looks pretty gnarly and crazy (laughs) there's these weird beauty and the and the beast you know upside down glass containers covering what appear to look like strange animals and things like that on some of the side tables in the hallways and things like that and it kind of just makes you like kibbs is going deeper and deeper into the house until he's finally really in the bedroom yeah right and it seems like Obviously, he's being led there. The woman in black is leading him deeper and deeper the whole time. He just mm-hmm. finally discovers the letters under the bed. Uh, and then there's like the whack, like the child's hand on handprint on the window. Right. And, you know, I mean, at this point, obviously, I, I would have been I would have been long gone. But that, that <laughs> just to go back to the house itself, it just makes you wonder. It's like, who were these people? Like, that's who the thing. They? Like, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. And we do get some allusions to their character i guess you could say like through the letters written by the woman in black and and even just to add to that right like he's uncovering he's going into the belly of the beast like and the house itself has a lot to reveal even like we get the one instance with the wallpaper where he's he's led 
<laughs> led mm. all the way up with the footsteps, uh, all the way up there and to what seems to be a rip with yes. something. And then it's literally written in blood, I think, it, that you could have like saved him. In her own blood, is what she yeah. wrote that in. Mm-hmm. And I sort of saw this, like him going, he's going, he's ballsy, right? Like he keeps going deeper and deeper until he finds more. And at first I'm like, is this a symbolic sort of dis- him like descending into madness because of tragedy he's been through? Like Sam would have said that, right? Because he's a skeptic. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. But really it's more like, when you get to the end of the movie, is he really getting closer to what he really needs? Like, is he getting closer maybe to death? Like he's Mm -hmm. getting closer to the woman in black. He is. It's not just about her showing him her story. She's trying to, in a really weird way, maybe guide him him to the light. Yeah. Help him like in in, in a really messed up way. Give him what he really wants. And, and even, There was that one scene where the camera's outside and Kibbs at this point has like followed her trail of breadcrumbs all the way up to the uppermost uh, window. Yeah. And so you see him looking out the window towards the cross in the marsh, but you see her peering over his shoulder. They're looking together. And so she's very much identifying with him, I think. And, and again, yeah, I think in her own way, sympathizing with him because she sees him. Yeah. And again, yeah, we get more and more as he gets into the belly of the beast we kind of get this really tragic backstory on how this woman in black came to be and uh, why she is the way that she is. And let's get into that. But before, let's just have a quick word from our sponsor. Do you feel there's something in life that is getting in the way of your happiness or overall life goals? Perhaps it's time to try BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp.com is a professional online counseling service that assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist from the comfort of your home. BetterHelp is committed to you from the get-go, from finding a great therapeutic match to making it easy and free to change counselors if need be. BetterHelp.com is available on multiple platforms and across the globe, so you have the help you need wherever you find yourself. Best of all, BetterHelp.com is more affordable than traditional online counseling. Fuck. Best of all, BetterHelp.com is more affordable than traditional offline counseling, with financial aid available for those who qualify. We want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp.com portal. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash portal. All right, and we're back. So let's get into some of this backstory because obviously this is kind of the, the crucial, what do you want to call it? Like This the, is the reason for her madness. It, exactly that. It's, yeah, it's the linchpin yes. for everything here. So we get the story told through letters at first and we see right off the bat in his first uh, instance going to the house, we see there was the death certificate of a seven year old. Yeah. So we have that in our heads right away. Further along into the film, we get more letters. So he, like you said, he uncovers that big chest and he, he digs it all out and he learns through the woman in black's writing that she, Jeanette Humphrey, her name had a son uh, and basically the whole plot was like Alice Drablo, her sister, taking her son, adopting him under her own name because Jeanette Humphrey is f- deemed unfit. She had mental illness of she some had, kind. She had, yeah, exactly. She was an unfit mother. She was sequestered in the house, which is even freakier. So yeah. she's still there, but her son has no idea who she is and has no connection with her. And she's denied that relationship through her sister Alice, who doesn't acknowledge her existence, doesn't give him the the letters and the, the birthday cards was a big part of it. So we get all of that, forcing her essentially to make these drastic measures. And so after the boy's killed, Kibbs learns that it was basically a carriage accident, the same accident he overheard. Yeah. So it's basically repeating again and again and again. Or she chose him is kind of what I interpret it as, like yeah. to see it or to hear it, just so he can have an idea of what happened. And that the boy was never recovered. 
So in the letters, we get this accusation from Jeanette or the woman in black accusing her sister of selfishness and, and basically abandoning the boy to the marsh yeah. and, and not even taking the proper measures to go back for him, even after death, just saving herself. And I love this here. You had a couple of quotes that speaks to like the vengeance of Jeanette and how she says that he is mine and can never be yours. So there's this whole jealousy struggle between the two. I'm assuming Alice probably just couldn't have kids of her own, which is pretty common. Like, you know, so maybe that and how essentially after the adoption goes through, she says in this one letter, I find it hard to express the depth of betrayal from you, my sister. And she just can't believe this. Right. Mm -hmm. And how, yeah, again, and she even says here, you didn't even give him a proper burial. You left him there in the mud. I will never forgive you, rotten hell. I will never forgive you. That's a key line because that's one of, the last, it. one of the last things we hear in the film. Yes. So this is very strange circumstances. Obviously a very unhappy family. And I really appreciate how we're given just enough. And we see it all. I love the visuals with the letters and stuff. But we're given just enough to keep an aura of mystery about this situation so that it's effective for a plot, but doesn't doesn't bleed too far into what it doesn't need to. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Totally. Mm-hmm. I want. Let's get to the where. Let's get to the kind of confrontation between her and Kips. Then, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the rocking chair, because there's the classic the classic rocking chair horror horror shot that mm-hmm. you see in a lot of uh, and a lot of stories too, like real real ghost stories, where it's like, yeah, that is a that's a classic classic thing to happen. He's unfazed though, and I just like. I was still at this point of the film unsure whether or not she's really trying to communicate this or if her, like, what was her ultimate end goal? Let's get into some of these, like, confrontations between the woman in black and Mr. Kipps. There's a few that happen in the bedroom, uh, the child's bedroom, and uh, there's the one scene where she drops from, we see how she dies, right? Mm-hmm. Like, where she's hung herself, and yeah. Kipps sees that and is totally freaked out. Yeah. Once again, I would have been out the door. And, you know, <laughs> and, and then we've got the rocking chair. She's in the room. She's trying to, like, feel the presence of her son almost in some regard, mm-hmm, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I still don't know at this point, like I was asking myself, like, I don't know what her end goal was with him and obviously with the village and with her intentions because what she does is takes children and leads them to their death. Mm-hmm. And I mean... So it just repeats fate over and over It just repeats over she and just, over and over again. She yeah. creates herself. You know what I mean? Like that was kind of like, I thought that was pretty frustrating about this, like... You know, as like a, a, like in all of his attempts to understand her and to right the wrong that was done to her. And then she, I think in that sense, I always toy with this where I'm like, okay, like she's just going to continue on doing her thing because that's her. And maybe like we talked about this even off the air where we were like, well, perhaps she's not even her anymore. It's just the demonic aspect that's left. So she really has no humanity. But if you go that way, then it's hard to interpret the film as like almost her sympathizing with him and giving him ultimately what he wants and his son, even though like you joked, you're like, well, it would have been nice for, uh, for his son to grow up and have a life, you know, that would have been great too, but yeah. whatever, I guess that's not going to happen because she doesn't see it that way. <laughs> well, and it makes, it, it makes you wonder what the situation really was with her sister then. Was she just, could she not have a baby? And it was totally like this woman wasn't actually that mentally ill and just got totally shoved into the, into the corner and mm-hmm. it was totally screwed over I think or so. was she genuinely a little a little bit crazy this these people did take care of her son and he did genuinely drown in in the marsh and it was a terrible mm-hmm. tragedy and they didn't go back because they it was too dangerous to do so and like he said they didn't have an automobile they they end up doing a body body recovery yeah. now horses we call it horsepower for a reason okay? <laughs> they had horses back then i'm sure they could have found something to try to drag <laughs> Someone who's <laughs> ventured in in the same fashion. I'm going with uh, Alice Drablo is a piece of shit and that she couldn't have a kid and that she did wrong her sister because I don't think anyone's that insane. How that is they, that? E- then they're both insane, right? They because are. it's like, how is that easier than just a, having a different, adopting a different kid or something like that? Why would you want I don't know. The, the son of your, of your, clearly genetics you're not all that proud of. Well, but it's still blood. Family blood is family blood, especially back in those days. It was still like Victorian yeah. era. <sighs> but the whole idea of her taking these children, let's get back to that for a sec here. Yes. Because it does seem like, yeah, like she obviously is a very vengeful ghost. Like look at the synopsis on Wikipedia. It's the first thing they see. <laughs> right. But like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it's, 
is this just her? Yeah, exactly. She can't see past that because she sees her sister and all of these village folk. None of them deserve to have their her like their children because she doesn't have hers, even though she's restored and the body of her son is taken from the marsh and placed with her, just like he does with the baby bird that I was alluding to at the beginning of the movie, right? right. Where he he goes to the effort. He literally almost dies in the process, like almost suffocates in mud. Like, again, right? I feel like he just doesn't care. He has this weird aura about him, right? Where he's yeah. just like, I'm just going to do what needs to be done and if it'll I die, just get done it, yeah. and then whatever. Like, you know? To, to backtrack a tiny bit too, that was literally the scariest moment of the movie visually for Ugh. me with the, uh, the the young boy crawling out of the grave, out of the mud, and then approaching the house. And then we mm. get the series of dead children standing in the woods. Oh, and he's yeah. out on the front porch being like, <gasps> yeah. I'm not going to do this trick or treat. I'm going to go back inside <laughs> this. Like, Cause that like, no, like that's definitely the scariest part of the movie. Like that oh, would yeah. have been me need a new pair of trousers for sure. Yeah. Because little kids crawling out of the, ooh, that <laughs> was physical manifestations pretty. of this woman's vengeance and hatred and hor- all the horrors that she's inflicted upon these children. Yeah. It's dark. It's pretty sad. And then of course uh, he's saved by Mr. Daly. Uh, at the last second, who doesn't believe that he's seen any of the things he claims he's just seen. Mm-hmm. He's like, I saw them. And he's I saw very, her and her son. Yeah, he's very matter of fact about it. He's not going to deny it any further. He's not going to entertain the, you know, the skeptic perspective. He 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 knows what he's seen. Right. And then again, right, we just get a continuation. I love, this happens twice, right? He goes to the house, has this encounter with her where he's shown or sees a bit of the story, comes back, kid dies goes back to the house, gets more of the story, goes back to the village, another kid dies. And this one's the worst one, I, I think. Yeah. With, with, uh, with yeah. Jerome's. That scene where they do the slow-mo and he's like looking across all the townsfolk that are kind of looking at him and then just like just the pain on on, on the Jerome's faces. Mm-hmm. But it's like... It's tough to watch. But then again, it's, it's the irony of it all, right? Because they were trying to keep their daughter safe. They locked her in the basement. It's like this ghost can go anywhere. You can't lock your kids up in a basement. It doesn't mm, matter. Yeah, exactly. Where you are. Which is interesting then because he, after we get all of the events and all of the whatever, his his restoration of the wrong, the writing of the wrong, and he's like, I just want my kid, because he has his kid coming on the train to the town. So yes. he's like, you know what? No, no, no. We're going back to London. Does he think he can escape it by going back to London? That's a good question. Can he? Yeah. Like, we yeah, never, can we, he? We never get an answer to that question, obviously. Is that, Yeah, I mean, well, I guess we sort of maybe do in the second film that came out in 2014 that maybe we'll watch and cover. Yeah. But in this movie, we, we were unsure. And that's the thing. With these types of hauntings and tragedies, this woman hung herself in a, in a room in that house. But the whole point of her vengeance was because of the son who passed away on the marsh. And it's, then where's yeah. the third step? So it's like, so she's not bound to the house. She's bound to the the village where her son was raised until he was gone, I mm-hmm. guess. Or at least that's what we're made and, to think. Well, and then when she's disturbed is when things start to happen. Like they said, as soon as she's seen, as soon as someone goes there and she's seen, right. that's when stuff starts to happen. Right. So it's almost like she can, she's like a magnet. She'll just follow you around. Yeah. But it's so localized. It's a big show. Someone else sees her and then she goes and kills someone else's kid. It's not like they would be like, oh, someone must have seen the woman in black. And then a bunch of kids from a town four hours away got into a horrible accident. Yeah, that's right? that's like interesting. It's, so it's localized to a certain degree. I don't know. Just, just so just so the people can see the cause and effect, perhaps, and see her. Because, like, that's, like, I wrote this in here, too. It was so dumb. Like, so after the Jerome secret child, Lucy, is, kills herself, essentially, uh, he, he has, yeah, this very painful moment. He run, he, He's really just seeing, like, I that this needs to be restored yes so that's when he actually goes and does the, the body recovery. the body recovery and all of that and it's kind of the final moments of the the, the climax like i feel like it's like a three-part climax it is you know what i mean because you get the the whole night of him being terrorized and all the stuff all the realizations you get the the fire scene which is almost like a continuation of that action it's almost just rising 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 yeah and then you get the whole scene with him and mr daly trying to do the body recovery and the restoration and all the stuff. Right. But it's so funny. Like, it's like, it's so annoying. Like, it's just such a double standard. Like I was like, so she wants him to understand her. 
Yet, <laughs> she feels free to just do this over and over and inflict the same fate on dozens of parents who have done absolutely nothing to her, personally. It's right. just a stupid argument with your sister, and the entire town has to hear about it. Yes. Come on. <laughs> but my, my and, and, and no, oh, totally, yeah, <laughs> worthwhile thing to say. Very frustrating. <laughs> I, I think, I think the answer to that is that she she is uh there's an equal amount of misery re-brought upon her it's not it's not as if this it's a catharsis it's like she is per, she is perpetually perpetually miserable for all eternity and she ends up inflicting more misery and it just compounds so it's almost like she's in this purgatory or something you know what i mean hmm. like it, it's like if or and if you wanted to bring drag religion into it i mean she probably wouldn't be getting to heaven Maybe she wouldn't be going down to whatever you think the other place is. You're stuck in the middle for all eternity. Like you're that—that yeah. that is damnation. And now you're 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 just you're you're made to do it. Like she's choosing to hmm. do it, I guess. Yeah. But then it's just more miserable for her, more and more forever. Maybe. And maybe she gains power from it. Because like I thought, I was like, well, if these people are that terrified and everyone kind of knows, but no one's talking about it, why couldn't they just all get together and? like manifest their own alternative Tulpas. powerful <laughs> energy force of belief that can like rectify this somehow or right. you know that's that's obviously a reach <laughs> yeah and 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 of course kips yeah. tries to do this they they have the the body on the bed he he puts he places the birthday cards that he was never given around him and she's not all that happy about it she comes screaming into the room the woman in black right yeah. we get that face and Here's here here we get to the stage where we're picking some bones with the film. That's where it could have been scarier. They could have mm. gone a little bit more uh, ghoulish on the uh, on the makeup for that. The actual close up of the face. Yes, yeah, it wasn't that that scary. It and, just looks like does, a lady in, in pale makeup. Yeah, and she does the same thing a few times where right. she's like, just I'm she's just gonna scream pony. and just like, and even the scream could have been a little bit scarier. Yes. I think that was kind of a It wasn't point. shrill enough for me. Mm, it, was it was a little pretty freaking shrill. But it was but dampened, it was like, though. It was like, it wasn't... It wasn't long enough. It wasn't enough. In my mind, they should have drawn it out longer. It needed a deeper beginning, like a... Like, go into a scream, you know what I mean? Like, it needed mm. a little more... Something a little Ghoulish. More. Ghoulish. Kind of an overtone. Yes. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you there. And the whole idea... That was frustrating, too, where it's like, dude, come on. He just, like, went to so much effort. He almost died in the mud just to recover your dead mummified slash bog body son here right dresses him up cleans him up gets him all pretty puts the cards around which your sister wouldn't do exactly sets the scene with some candles and some toys gets everything going with the music like you know with the animatronics and things like that and then all you want to do is come in and scream in his face and that but that's my question though and that's it. it is it because they can't be reunited like is it like they even put the bodies together Actually, after that, that's right? Interesting. Like, Maybe they because, can't. Right? Like that's yeah. what I'm thinking. Like why wouldn't she be? Why won't she be re- reunited with him? Is this question I put into the doc here, or is he just literally somewhere else? He's not in that same space of purgatory, afterlife, or whatever dimension that she drags these kids into. Yeah. Like he's passed on. And she is right, stuck yeah. in this state, dragging these children into the because because mm-hmm. we know, we know that they're there that there's trapped. She's like this like little yeah. Bo Peep with all these little kids of the, are the little sheep. Mm-hmm. And when the the son of uh, Elizabeth Daly when she, when he's speaking through her and that's really creepy too. You get that kind of like auto tune yeah. kind of thing going on. Mm-hmm. Not auto tune. It's not uh, T Pain, but you know <laughs> what I, you know like what I mean. It's got that thing, and it's like she makes us, and then it's like she's coming, she's coming, mm-hmm. as if they have to run away. It's like the upside down. They're yeah. running away from her in this l- weird space yeah. that they can't pass on, she can't pass on, and she'll never be able to find Ooh, her son. It's like her own little flock of children. And that's why she just keeps repeating over and over and over again, like at the end, like, never forget, never, like, you're never, never forgive, forgive, never forgive. Never forgive. Because he does all of that, they put the bodies together, he thinks everything's hunky-dory, they go to the train station, him and Mr. Daly, and he's all like, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kibbs, like, you've really done a service for this town, and everything, blah, 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 and he's got his son by his side, and all this stuff, and then, of course, we get the finale where yeah this this gets a little dark here so final scene we get the woman in black reappearing after we have that kind of drawn out sequence not too long i guess but there's a sequence of just kind of like panning around in the different empty rooms of the house and you just get the whispers never forget never forget never forget 
never forget. And she's just getting more and more resolute. And with each child she takes, I think she gets more resolute. Yes. And so she's like, no, I, I'm going to continue in my ways. Yeah. And she, again, right, you can go back and forth. I'd love to hear people's opinions on this, where is she doing him a favor by taking him and his son? So and they can be reunited. Reunited. She doesn't trap them in the same purgatory. They go to the light. They're all reunited. It's a very peaceful moment, right? And yeah. they're all together. And the son gets to finally meet his mother, which is quite beautiful. And she's gorgeous, obviously. She's right. just this milk and honey flowing blonde hair with all the white. She's an angel, right? So she's going to go take them away. And then you get the woman staring at them so longingly, just in her black she can't have whatever it. kind of thing. She yeah. can never have that. Yeah. She'll never have that. She'll never be with her son. We don't yeah. see him. No. And she just, and then that quick snap of the neck towards the camera where she sees you. Yeah. And I love that. That gave me chills down my spine. I do agree with you. I think she was, I mean, I, again, yeah, I want to hear what you guys have to, to have to say about that. Was she guiding him to this? Was this some sort of a weird ass favor of some kind? I kind of of the mind that it was because I was thinking this entire time, going back to the chick locked up in the basement, probably not the best way to keep your kids safe. All of these kids would have been literally more safe if they were just handcuffed to their parents. Like you can't lock them up. Like, you know what I mean? It's like (laughs) somewhere else. You have to physically be watching them. You have to be there. If this chick's going to drink lie, you have to stop them from drinking lie. Right. You know what I mean? And then this is what happens at the end. He's holding his son's hand and he just lets it slip away. It's like all this stuff has happened. Like you're at, you're at Disney world and you're not yeah. even going to hold your kid's hand. You're just going to like, right. just gently like, like Mort from Bob's limp and clammy, just freaking barely <laughs> holding onto it at all. You're, yeah. It's like, and then he, and then he just walks away and you're not even paying attention. So it says, I think she was f- clouding his judgment in that moment as well to allow this to happen. It wasn't just, she was drawing the kid away. Mm-hmm. She was messing with the, his perception yeah. of reality at that. It's not like Mr. Daly's that like all absorbing and like him too too like daily didn't notice yeah how does nobody notice nobody. like none of them noticed mm-hmm. not even the nanny it's so anyway. too late well we're getting down to the end of it here do you have any more down to the nitty-gritty anything else worthy of note i think we've done a pretty exhaustive i mean there's there's a bunch more symbolism and all kinds of things we didn't touch on that we could but overall i really really love this movie it's it does spook me i don't have mm-hmm. kids but it still really spooks me and I am totally believe in entities like this. This is a hundred percent the reason why every time Amber brings out the Ouija board and makes jokes, I'm like, <laughs> no, no. Can we? Oh my like, gosh, we should touch on that even before oh we wrap God. up here. Actually, yeah, yeah. Let's I, tell I that story. Believe in the power of spirits. Like, okay, so we had a power outage. We've had a couple of the last what, like seventy two hours. We had one happen like two nights ago, and of course it's. Canada, so it's friggin' dark by four. Uh, so, <laughs> so, anyways, we're sitting in the dark with our candles. We just lit them, and I get this devious idea because I see our Ouija board <laughs> underneath the couch. And normally we don't really notice it, but I happen to notice it. And I pulled it out, and I just, I love looking at it. So I just pulled it out, and just, I'm so tempted with that little thing, anyways. And we're sitting there. And what happened? I guess you just pulled out your phone. So you're like, well, we can't do anything else. We'll listen to a podcast. And so we we're going to pull up Astonishing Legends. And their latest podcast was on <laughs> what? Like demonic stories about Ouija boards? Yeah, I don't know exactly. Yeah, they're covering the stories, of stories of Ouija stories, exactly. creepy stories. And we had no idea. I hadn't seen no. any posts of, about it or anything. So we were like, hmm, that's a little too on serendipitous the nose, there. Sir. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it was so weird because you were, you're always very hesitant. Every time I pull a thing out, you're just like, no, mm. we're not doing this. We're not doing it. We've literally never actually done a seance. We tried anymore. at Emerald Lake. We tried. But anyways, we didn't get any Sasquatch spirits. For <laughs> we didn't. That's true. But I actually had like a tingling sensation running through my body. Right. Like I was like, I literally felt like almost giddy. Like I was almost like, I just wanted to like <laughs> do it. Like I just wanted to like touch it. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> We're just gonna I just, I just feel like the power outage crossed with, we didn't know that was their new episode and you had pulled it out simultaneously. as so I was like da- pulling it up to download. It was just kind of like, well, but you told me that after I had that feeling and I, I was just like, no, I know. Wait but- a second. Like what? Like, okay. <laughs> but anyways, if anyone is planning on experimenting with a Ouija board and has a fun story to tell us uh, yes. this Halloween, we would love to hear it. And of course, shout out to Scott and Forrest at Astonishing Legends. Yeah. And uh, we have to go listen to those episodes. Exactly. Um, so anyways, I guess anything else before we wrap up here? Honestly, I, I'm just really curious 
about your guys' thoughts on this movie. Did, did you like it? Were you able to get away from just seeing uh, Harry the entire time, <laughs> unlike my sister, uh, Emily? Uh, you know, I, I yeah, no, I, I definitely just want to hear what you guys think about the afterlife. Vengeful spirits, like what are they really capable of? Does it make sense that she was venturing out of the house mm. to afar and capable of doing these things? I guess so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. All right. I don't know. Well... I guess thank you to everyone for listening. Yes. We have a really fun little Halloween episode coming your way next week. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, we do have a really awesome Halloween contest going on in our network. Yes. So the Share Your Spirit Halloween I don't even know, celebration, I guess. Hell yeah. Uh, we just want to see your spooky stuff, whatever that may be, Halloween style, how you celebrate. Um, haunted baking, sure. I put <laughs> creepy costumes or pets all dressed up. Hell yeah, we want to see it. I don't know if you carve a sweet pumpkin too. Like, of course. We're going to go get some pumpkins. Uh, we're going to go vote. We yes. have a provincial election. We so we're going to go vote election. and go get our pumpkins. Get some pumpkins. But we just want to see what you guys want to do for Halloween because obviously there's going to be more in house celebrations this year, I'd yeah. imagine. So share it with us on our socials. Uh, all you have to do is follow the network Instagram, Strange Pods, for all of the details on how you can enter totally. and win a sweet little prize pack. We actually, another fun little Easter egg I'll throw into the end of this episode here. We actually just got new acrylic pins yes itp pins the ufo design so (laughs) we have new merch so anyways that's for our patrons we're going to send some out and then we're also going to have it as part of the halloween pack along with uh halloween candy obviously i think we're going to include an original print and a t-shirt or a hat and we haven't decided on that yet and there's obviously some other goodies too oh my god so so much cool stuff it's definitely uh for all the network shows too yeah not just us us, exactly Mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's it's pretty broad because it's not just a pumpkin carving contest like we've done in years past right so yeah, yeah anything halloween so definitely hit us up at strange pods on instagram and uh yeah we can't wait to see what you guys uh what you guys are cooking up for halloween <laughs> as always thank you so much uh to everyone uh who's left us a review as of late those uh, five star ratings and reviews really really help us out so we really appreciate that you guys know who you are uh, and if you haven't had the the chance yet please uh, do us a solid leave us a five star rating and review wherever you listen to the show it really helps us out you guys are the best and uh thank you so much to our patreon supporters and everyone for listening to the show and as always until next time on into the portal your gateway to the bizarre Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.